and welcome back to Redirecting. In this video, I am going to be talking about the many, 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 many conversations that are being uh, held around the country and around the world right now. These conversations are centered around race and race relationships. Now, uh, for a very long time, my mind has been in the process of redirecting um, in times before, years gone by, uh, there was a certain way that I presented a story uh, when I came on my channel. And um, it came from more of a place of you know, anger and frustration and things of that nature from time to time. Um, it does peak out from time to time. Now I try to explain things um, a lot better, um, seeing that things are uh, shaping up a certain way in this country and in the world and so um, in this video I want to shed some light on what they call the conversation uh, there are so many con conversations going on right now and uh, these conversations to me are fruitless because um, one particular conversation I had um, they, I mean, I'm sorry not that I had but I heard uh, they were actually talking about we as a people being tired of the conversation and that is something that I've felt and expressed uh, for so long. Uh, my husband and myself, we talk a lot about these things. Um, um, our children, we talk a, a lot about these things with them, especially our older son, um, Alaya. He, he works in an environment uh, where he's surrounded by people who um, have a certain way about them, if you know what I mean, towards so-called black people. Okay, not all of his co-workers, but uh, many of them he shares stories with us that uh, they are very much aware of their privilege, very much aware of it. And so back to the conversation about conversation, um, there seems to be a lot of that going on. And uh, basically, it's us as so-called black people trying to convince others that we want it to be, or we want to be treated fairly. We're trying to convince others that what they are doing to us is very harsh and uh, what they're saying to us and how they um, deal with us is unrighteous, unconstitutional. We're trying to do all of these things and we're trying to express our pain. We're trying to ask for justice. Uh, we're trying to ask for understanding, reparations, um, uh, if the shoe were on the other foot, how would you feel? Uh, what would you do? Uh, why are you doing this? Um, can you please take a look at this and understand our position of pain? We're trying to convince others to look at our condition and feel any type of sympathy. We're trying to have a conversation. Why is my question. Why should we have a conversation? Why is there always a need for a conversation? Do we have to hold people's hand through this and explain to them, look, you are hurting us. Look, what you did to Tamir Rice was awful. What you did to Mike Brown was unrighteous. What you did to Trayvon Martin, all of these things. Breonna Taylor, Tatiana Jefferson, Ayanna Jones, so many that we cannot even name. What about those who never get reported? What about the incidents? And let me just uh, refresh your memory on something that happened to my, myself and my husband. Now, in our case, things worked out fine, okay? But think about others who may have been in similar situations to where they were left dead on the side of the road. Myself and my husband, when we lived in Michigan and we were walking down the country road that we lived on, it was a dirt road. I was pregnant at the time. So I wasn't able to really pick up and run if I had to, but you get two Caucasian males, six o'clock in the morning, we're walking, okay, my husband and myself, and no one's out, no one's awake, not a lot of traffic, not a lot going on at all. In their pickup truck, they come charging at us as we're walk walking down the road. Now, we know that they're charging at us because they were on the other side of the road at first, they saw us, and then they jumped to the side of the road where we were walking and they're speeding towards us, right? And so instead of trying to wait to see if they were gonna just hit us and kill us, 
we decided we better get out of their way. We jumped down into the ditch to keep from getting hit, okay? They pull up on the side of us and start laughing their crazy heads off. So they were trying to make us a statistic that morning. But we had the presence of mind to realize what was taking place and we jumped into a ditch to keep from getting hit by these two young Caucasian males. Now imagine the number of stories where something very similar happened but the black person didn't move and they didn't jump. The number of young now imagine the number of black people who were in similar situations walking down the road and the driver hit them and kept going. Imagine. So for me, having a conversation, having a seat at the table saying, look, let's talk. We just want to explain some things to you. Why should we have to explain our oppression? It should be very clear and known by now that these people are fully aware of our condition in this world. They are fully aware of who oppresses us, how long it's been going on, where it goes on. Don't think for one minute that they are not fully aware of it. Now, of course, you have the people who just completely shut it off of their mind. They don't want to talk about it, don't want to deal with it. And if they feel that you are bringing too much attention to it, they try to put you in the same category and say that you are just as bad as the person who has hung someone from a tree just for merely talking about it. If you talk about it, in some of their minds, you are just as bad as the person who carried out a heinous crime, just for merely talking about it. In other words, how dare you discuss your pain? Because when you discuss your pain, it makes me think that I have to do something or give up something just to hear you. Now, I understand something about our present situation. I understand that this is something that was predestinated. Some of you will not understand that and don't understand it because uh, you may not believe in the Bible. You may not believe that there is a creator or, or an Elohim or God in heaven, as the world calls him. But there has got to be an understanding gained from those of you who are trying to figure this thing out, thinking that we can vote our way out of oppression thinking that we could have a conversation with perpetrators about this and maybe they will change their mind and soften the blows or um, lessen the blows. All of this is utter nonsense. This is all by design. This is not by mistake. None of this is by mistake. None of this is by chance, okay? The whole system, the way it is put together is all by design. And for some of you, you say design by who? right? We think that this is the system that is designed by white supremacy. But where, the, where did white supremacy come from? Where did it come from? Why do they feel comfortable in it? That is the big question. Why is it that you can't even explain that um, the knife in my back is not fair when I've done nothing to you? Why is it that if you tell them, please take the knife off my back, that they will call you a racist. You say to yourself, what kind of mindset thinks like this? What kind of person thinks that it's wrong for another person to say, can you kindly remove the knife from my back? Can you stop doing this to me? Can you stop killing our old, our young, our children? What kind of person thinks that you are the evil one for making such a request? I will be the first to admit that this stuff back in the day it used to really irk me so bad to where I didn't know what to do because I had a Christian mindset that you have to love everybody and forgive everybody and all of this but now I have a greater understanding of what is happening in this world I understand that evil and enemies come in black and white and Asian and Latino and all those in between I understand that evil exists on every corner with that understanding, I've come to understand how the human mind thinks and how people think, how different racial groups think. And I also understand that within each racial group, 
there is a remnant that is set apart from the rest of their group who do not think, act, or behave the way the rest of them do. But when it comes to the system of white supremacy and how it has affected the lives of black people, we cannot be expected to ignore centuries of damage done and lives lost just so some people can feel comfortable as they sleep at night. Any discomfort they have should come from their own conscience. Their own conscience should convict them of what they have continued to do to us. This is not days going by. This is a continuation. This is why we are um, looking at this issue of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Aubrey right now. And I don't know what it is about specifically George Floyd that has the whole world talking saying that we need to have a conversation. And I'm like, a conversation about what? The same one we've been having for so long where we've been begging and pleading and marching and singing and asking for some type of understanding. Why should we have to convince someone? And it's just like a woman who has been um, violated. She has to convince the violator that what he did to her was wrong. And he in turn gets angry at her and, and say, how dare you bring up what I did to you? Or how dare you bring up what um, violators do to women, period? How dare you? That is the mindset that we are dealing with where if we even talk about it, we get evil in return. What kind of mind thinks like that? So the conversation that people are telling us we need to have and the conversation that people are having right now, as a matter of fact, we're seeing so many conversations around the web. Hey, let's talk, let's talk, let's talk. I saw conversations on this network and that network and even Donald Trump had a conversation. But at the end of the day, it's all talk and talk is cheap. Everybody's always talking to us about reform and about change and about acceptance. Everybody's always talking to us about what should be done, but they always stop shy of doing it. Everyone has a conversation about what can improve. And within that conversation, they're telling us how horrible our people are without even taking into consideration the system that may have driven them in that direction. Now, again, I have to keep it real. I have to keep it real. I'm, ha I'm talking about this um, from a natural and a secular standpoint, but there is a spiritual aspect as well. I understand why all of these things are happening. I understand that we are all playing a role that was predestinated before the foundation of the world. But that aside, I'm trying to give you a human understanding of what we see happening with people and how they think and how they function and how they deal with one another. We are dealing with one another treacherously. And so when you have these conversations, you have to understand that it's just a few people at the table having this conversation. Just a few people at the table. Even if you come and you sit and there's an audience with 10,000 people and uh, you have a panel on a stage of maybe 100 people, that is a drop in the bucket when you look at any population. A room filled with 10,000 20,000 people, that is nothing. That is a drop in the bucket. That will affect no change whatsoever. It's just a conversation. So when I see um, Caucasians kneeling and kissing the feet of black people and apologizing on behalf of all white people, and I mentioned this in another video, you cannot apologize on behalf of all white people. I'm pretty sure James Byrd, the guy who was uh, chained to the back of a pickup truck down in Jasper, Texas. I'm pretty sure that he don't want a verbal apology from someone who had nothing to do with the incident on behalf of those who did, those who strung him up. Oh, please forgive us. 
So you have these people come and saying, forgive us. Forgive who? All white people. So you're basically begging us to forgive all white people for 400 or more years of torture. Torture beyond anyone's imagination. But then if you were to ask this question, if you were to flip the script and the same exact deeds were done but in the opposite direction, white people being the victims of all of these heinous things for over 400 years at the hands of, and I'm going to say Arabs, I'm not going to even say blacks. I'm not going to even say blacks just to keep, just so I can bring some perspective to this because you'll have those in the comment section who will say, well, uh, black people kill more white people statistically than um, any other direction, which is a cotton picking lie. People just pull these statistics out of the crack of you know where. But anyway, anyway, I'm going to say, what if Arabs were oppressing white people for 400 years? Would anybody expect white people to turn around and tell the Arabs, we forgive you, we love you, we just want to live in peace with you? Would anyone expect white people to turn around and say that to Arabs and to just fall on their faces with forgiveness and love for Arabs who had oppressed them for 400 years, oppressed their children, their men, their women, their old, their young, burned their houses down, raped them, separated them from their children, stole their land, stole their sanity, beat many stripes on their backs, cut their limbs off, cut off their private parts, raped, maimed, tarred and feathered. Would anyone expect white people to forgive Arabs for having done all of that to them for 400 years? And not just forgive, but love. If you say, yes, you tell them a cotton picking lie, See, but when it comes to so-called black people, everyone expects us to be ignos, ignoramuses, and say, we forgive you and we love you for all of those horrible things. Tossing our babies to alligators, we forgive you. All of the horrible things. And guess what? Some of you listen to this. Some of you listen to these stories and these narratives. And I'm talking to not just white people, but even some so-called black people. Some of you listen to these things and you say the past is in the past. And you feel this thing, especially white people on this one, you feel this thing bubbling up on the inside. And to you, I'm this evil woman for even talking about it. How dare you rub that in our faces? You declare that I am evil for merely talking about what my ancestors went through and what my people continue to go through to this day. You have to ask yourself, if you don't expect white people to forgive Arabs for doing the same thing, if the, if the script were flipped, or let's say Chinese people did it to them for 400 years, or Latinos, any other group, 400 years of oppression against white people. There is nobody on this planet who would truthfully, honestly say that they would expect white people to be forgiving and loving towards that group of people. Now, I'm not talking about individual relationships that form and thrive. I'm talking about as a whole, would they be expected to even trust these people? Nobody thinks that way. So why do you think black people should? Why? Ask yourself why. Are you that evil, that detached, that reprobate to where you expect somebody else to do it, but you yourself would not do it? Ask yourself what the heck is wrong with you? to where you expect somebody else to do something that you wouldn't dare do. That is a reprobate mind. 
a reprobate mind. So, again, I know for a fact that I could sit down and have a reasonable, very calm conversation about race. But the mere mention of certain things would cause certain people to be infuriated and angered. This is why White It Out Part 2 was banned worldwide. Because it wasn't us, but it was just various groups and people and individual individuals who were talking about what so-called white people, and I'm talking about white people, were talking about what white people have done to other people around the world, other groups of people, what they've done to black people, Native Americans, just all different kinds of people. These were documentaries that were already out there. And we merely put together a work that so many have seen to the point where they had to ban it. Okay, conversation about what? We've been having this conversation for a long time. Who are we kidding? It's just talk. And if you know biblical prophecy, they will continue to talk until they are forced to do more than just talk. At some point, according to biblical prophecy, according to biblical prophecy, some of them are going to say, look, enough is enough. And I'm not just talking about verbally, because right now we got a lot of verbal support. But when the Most High God, as the world calls him, begins to stir them up, some of them are going to really do what is required of them to do. While others are going to dig their heels in and say, I'm not doing nothing for those Negroes. Nothing. They are going to take that perpetual hatred to the grave. And that is biblical prophecy. Some of you believe it, some of you don't. The truth will always be whether you accept it or not. There are some very strange things happening in the world right now. We are watching it all as it unfolds. So many conversations being had, so many people upset, hurt, afraid. All kinds of emotions are flaring right now. But remember this, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We have to understand this. And the better we will be when we do, the better off we will be when we do, when we understand these things. We are only looking at things from a natural standpoint, but it's time for us to look beyond the natural and see with our spiritual eyes that some very magnificent things are taking place in this world. And it is all authored by our Creator, the Most High Yah. I am done with this video. Um, conversation, for me, worthless. Because actions speak louder than words. I'm out. Be sure to ring the bell to be notified of new uploads on this channel. And also, comment, share, like, and subscribe.